In my recently published book, Play to Potential, published by Penguin, I talk about the framework Flavor, where I discuss how we can all lead a full and a meaningful life. However, a few pages in the book don't quite capture the nuances in somebody's journey. So in that context, I'm excited to present the Flavorful Life series, where I talk to six different individuals who I believe are striving to play to their full potential and are leading a flavorful life. The first exemplar in this series is Ravi Shankar Iyer. Ravi comes from the Indian middle class with a passion for stories and storytelling and mythology. He gets 11th rank in CA, he joins IMA, and then starts a career in consulting. But after several twists and turns, he finds what really energizes him and what gives him meaning, and now is a storytelling coach. I've known Ravi for several years. We've spoken and exchanged notes in the context of our respective podcasts. I spent some time with a philanthropic organization called Social Venture Partners, where Ravi also has given time helping mentoring some of the organizations, tell the pitch story effectively. We've done some workshops with clients together. I've always found Ravi to be centered, balanced, contented, happy, and passionate about what he's doing. I find that Ravi has done significant inner work on himself and has been very deliberate about many of the choices and the risks and the twists and turns he's taken. I find he and his wife Praveena to be great exemplars of a life of contentment, meaning, purpose, balance, and joy. So without further ado, please tune into the first conversation as part of the Flavorful Life series with Ravi Shankar Iyer. Ravi, thank you so much for uh, making the time for this uh, fireside chat. Hey, thank you so much, Deepak. My pleasure is all mine. We've been we've been interacting in different contexts and different forums. Uh, so it's lovely to have you uh, as a, as a guest as a part of the series, and excited to explore uh, your journey a little bit. But just to sort of level set, Ravi, I'd love for you to give a little bit of context to what you do and why you do what you do. Maybe just a little bit of. Uh, who you are, what you do, a little bit of the why behind the what, just for listeners to get some sense. Yeah, sure, Deepak, happy to to share that. So in, uh, so I, I call myself a storytelling coach and to, to break that down, I help uh, leaders uh, tell a better story of their work, uh, especially mm. in uh, what I call as uh, high stakes communication situations, right? Mm. And uh, um, so if you kind of look at, uh, if you zoom back and look at the context of what's uh, changing in the world, especially when it comes to communication during high stakes events, uh, one trend that you will see is that uh, everybody is now facing a data explosion. Uh, the same person who had access to only uh, X amount of data now has 10 X and then that's mm. increasing to 20 X. And of course there are more tools available at our disposal to, to understand the data. But at the end of the day, the time that you have to explain that, that can't change, right? So you still have a 20 minute, 15 minute, 30 minute presentation to to share that uh, a larger amount of data in, in whichever area that you're going to be presenting in. The second big challenge is that while the time has remained the same, the data has increased, but the audience's attention spans mm. are not going up. They're in fact going down. <laughs> yeah, so, going so you down have is a more, mild way of putting it. Huh? Mild way of putting it, yeah. So uh, they're crashing with with this, uh, the amount of, you know, short form content that we're all, uh, uh, you know, bombarded with. So, so that's a big challenge that people have to be able to convey, um, you know, some very serious uh, material uh, in terms of the work that they have done, in terms of the hard work that the team has put in. And it may be a high stakes communication event might be like a quarterly business review, a client presentation, a project performance review, even, even yeah. you know, an appraisal discussion, right? And um, th these are high stakes because the decisions that are taken in these meetings can have uh, big implications for uh, your organization, for your team, and for yourself. And so it's it's imperative that leaders put their best foot forward, right, during mm -hmm. these uh, meetings. And um, what often happens is when you kind of ask the leader, say, how did that go? Like, uh, you know, it, it could have gone better. And especially if you ask the audience, they'd be like, you know, hey, what was the point? What were you trying to tell? You know, this is, kenna kya chate ho? You know, what, what was uh, this, where, where was this going? And so um, I've kind of seen that happen with myself uh, when I was in consulting and I went through a journey of my own as, as we can talk about later. Um, and then I've seen that happen with many others, right? So, so I kind of come from a point of view of that um, 
that, that there are these tools which are called as storytelling techniques uh, which are available which can very very well be learned there is no such thing as a natural or a born storyteller everybody can learn them and i love learning and researching about them I almost like you know i, I have a childlike enthusiasm to learn more about uh, these techniques of storytelling and that's what i've been doing for many many years now more formally for the last seven and a half years but informally mm -hmm. for like pretty much from the beginning of my career and uh, so what gives me most joy, uh, Deepak, is to kind of, you know, understand these techniques, to structure them, to provide, to figure out frameworks, tools, techniques, and then to um, share them with others in a way that uh, opens up their mind uh, to first the requirement that hey, this is important mm -hmm. and um, hopefully makes them change their mind in the one day or two day uh, kind of a workshop or, a, you know, interaction that I have with them. Uh, such that, you know, they leave that interaction with me with um, a new perspective of how to mm. how to deal with these high stakes communication events um, and hopefully some tools that they can kind of use for uh, the rest of their life and hopefully uh, uh, curiosity to learn these techniques um, on an ongoing basis. So that's Lovely. broadly what, what I tend to do, uh, as I mentioned, through workshops, maintaining calls, etc. Lovely. Uh, love to explore these things as we move forward, Ravi. Uh, but I think one of the pieces uh, I'm curious about um, is the family element, right? So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about maybe just what your family is today. Uh, you know, maybe just uh, the key the key actors uh, in in the in the in what you would call family, and also maybe take us back in time very quickly. You know, I'm curious about how people are shaped by the first 15, 20 years of their life. So a little bit of how did Ravi get shaped by those 15, 20 years, socially, uh, economically. Uh, in terms of exposure. So maybe if we could talk about the family element, both the current and a little bit of uh, the early years. Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, we have my dad at home. Uh, my mom passed away in 2010. Uh, there's Praveena, my wife, uh, two kids, Advait, who's uh, almost 12 now. He'll be 12 in March. And Swara will be six uh, this uh, 27th okay. Jan. So... <laughs> Uh, so we have we have our hands full in terms of you know managing these two, uh, especially the little one. And uh, so growing up, Deepak was in a, a suburb of Bombay called Sion, uh, of course. in a smaller part called Jain Society. There uh, till I was at till about eleven years old or so, and then uh, I completed my schooling from a small town in Maharashtra called Aurangabad. So in fact, schooling I associate more with Aurangabad, uh, although growing up is more with uh, Sion. Uh, but Bombay is kind of, you could say, home, right? Because after my schooling, also I came back uh, and lived in Thane and I did my college in Bombay. And so first 15, 20 years, I would say majority in Bombay, uh, about four years in Aurangabad, but all all, all Maharashtra. And uh, so in terms of, um, yeah, so it's when we look back at the house in Sion, right? Now I would say it was a small house uh, because it was, it, it, it was about 400 square feet or so and that time we never ever thought mm. that oh this is a small house there are big houses mm. it was a great house <laughs> you know we never ever felt that oh this is inadequate i think compared to uh, majority of india i think incredibly privileged upbringing to mm. have an english uh, medium education to have uh, two parents who were nurturing who were you know talking and you know taking care of me uh, my dad was uh, working with an mnc since the mid 70s till till pretty much he retired so yeah, so I think um, there was no um, problem in terms of finances or or any other way. So at least I I never felt any of that, right? So incredibly lucky that way. But in terms of I think forces that I would say shape me, right? Uh, I, reading would definitely be a huge mm. force, and uh, I still remember. I think uh, nowadays, of course, kids re uh, start reading much earlier. Uh, this mm. was in the early eighties when uh, I don't think it was as um, uh, prevalent and uh, I was in second grade, uh, which must have been what like uh, 19 mid, mid 85 or something. And uh, my dad took me uh, in in Sayanuli to a small garage kind of a shop, which was a lending library, and that was my first trist, uh, a long, mm -hmm. long, long trist with lending libraries. And my first book that I ever picked up was Cha Cha Chaudhary, right? Wow. <laughs> and uh, you can't go wrong with with that as a first book and. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, this is so much fun. And I can read and I can enjoy and I can keep going back and take as many books as I want uh, or as many times as I want. And uh, I think that uh, sparked off uh, an interest which is um, unending. And I, I can like, Lovely. you know, I, right now I, I 
I read like multiple books and um it it like it, it the typical journey that any 80s 90s kids goes through right you know you go mm. to trinkle amar chitra katha chanda mama uh, then you start reading any britain uh, then slowly from there you know gatha christi uh then all this robert ludlum and uh, sydney sheldon um, that kind of stuff that's sydney uh, sheldon yeah that, that whole journey i kind of went through in fact i remember 10th vacation i had come back from aurangabad and i was staying at my aunt's place in sain and there was a library called ramesh in king circle in, in matunga close to king circle and um, my uh, day would be like in the morning take a bus go to the library pick up a few books come back and read the whole day do nothing else right you know i had no social life whatsoever so and i think i overdosed on fiction in that vacation so much that uh, i kind of stopped reading fiction uh, after that so somewhere a twist happened and i moved to non fiction and now i almost exclusively read non fiction because i kind of feel that real life can be so so interesting uh, why do i need to look for imagination right so um so and and yeah so so that's that's been i think when enduring uh, um, I, i realized later that not everybody reads and Uh, having the inclination to read especially non fiction can be um can, can be useful uh, because a lot That's of right. my ideas that i get what i implement is basically me exploring the world of books and then finding interesting stuff and then you know you know making it uh, relevant for for my audience so i think that that's been one um, i would say huge um, um force shaping me um other like a couple of things that uh, come to mind is that uh, uh the the influence both my dad and mom has been interesting both were very contrasting personalities mm-hmm. um my dad is extremely organized structured methodical in everything he does like supremely prior planned um and he kind of instilled in me i'm not i'm i lean towards him in that but not as like n- n- not a patch on him in terms of the amount of planning he would do but for example he would uh i mean once it became once exams became serious like 10th 12th uh, ca exams and all he would make sure he would not come and sit with me and you know make me study but he'll ask me ravi what is going to be your plan for the uh, study mm. period so let's say we got 10 days 12 days whatever so mm. he would just say make a plan so okay mm. we are starting and especially this is important during mm. ca exams right so you will get two months two and a half months three months sometimes to study if you don't plan it is zup you know the time goes and you don't even realize uh, how it went so we used to kind of really i, I mean i i i thought it it's a common thing everybody does it but i realized not everybody does it to the to the extent that my dad made me do and that helped right so to just break things down it was like classic breaking down a problem into component parts and then say okay this lesson on this day morning then this day in the afternoon yeah. and so on and uh, often i would be disappointed that oh my god i'm not following the plan at all but i think it would have been much much worse uh, had i not set up any plan so so i think that uh, whole uh, uh, even even today when i teach i rely a lot on structure and frameworks and ways to make uh, the complex easy and i think that clearly comes from him and uh, from my mom i got this you know thing of saying it's not all left brain and analysis there's also um, a huge role for creativity for being spontaneous for being comfortable with crowds right so i'm what you would say as an ambivert uh, that i i am happy and comfortable being on my own but uh, i'm very very comfortable with a crowd uh, of people and did that's important when you're teaching career as well if i may ask uh no so she did have a career uh, till i was born and i think when i was really young I, i used to fall sick unfortunately so i'm kind of the reason for her leaving a career with a bank she had a career with a bank uh, but i think uh, in a way uh, it, she really found herself uh, flowering uh, when she moved to aurangabad because smaller town and so uh, suddenly more opportunity so there she mm. was very active so she used to take music classes carnatic music classes she used to write uh, articles for a local newspaper called lokmat times uh, and there was a, a tamil cultural association where she was you know very very active part of right so so she was very very uh, busy and happy uh, during uh, those days and i think um, she used to write poetry across texts um, and and the music part so i think a lot of that love for movies uh clearly comes from that side right so i think um that that balance between structure and creativity is something that has stayed with me that even today i see when i'm teaching uh, both are important and i think that's also something that uh, helped me uh, from from the and maybe just the last piece if i may ask you to reflect uh, how have your attitudes towards money been shaped by your first let's say through your growing up years if i may so uh, yeah i mean it's um it i didn't really have like a clear 
uh, attitude or desire or mm. goal that okay i need to earn so much it was not really there it was of course there that you know you need to have something i think the uh, in in southern indian families of course a job is what you kind of really look for right and the name of the company was more important right mm. so so i remember during just after uh, uh, the c exam i was getting a job interview with hul uh, hll it was called then and in the sun unilever and i did not get through but the the excitement in the family was palpable oh my god ravi what an interview for hll um, so i think it was more the brand that was important that you know whatever they'll pay they'll be good enough what was the was a general thinking uh, so i i ended up taking a job with lnt which was also kind of regarded as one of those nice of safe companies right so of it was course. not really uh, so m- money wasn't really but i remember when i graduated from ime and got a job at uh, feedback infra um i was pleasantly surprised by what they were paying me i was like you know really you're able to afford that <laughs> and it was not clearly one of the higher paying uh, uh, companies on campus so somewhere i don't know where this came deepak but somewhere when i was mid teens early 20s or whatever i somehow got this realization in my mind that the money game is a fuzzer it that mm-hmm. looking for saying oh, i want to optimize for how much i earn um you'll never be happy is mm. i don't know how i got that idea in my mind but i probably used to see other people who uh, fair you know who would compare that no you know what this guy is getting so much and this guy is now at this uh, level that's and very early yeah? i must i, must I don't know how that. and really I, I, I was actually thinking about you know what uh, what might have cost it but i don't know so um i would kind of uh, always see somebody who's comparing saying okay x is getting more i would say but there's somebody above x and but somebody above x is uh, above uh, the person above x right and so on so yeah i think uh, I, i yeah so that that has been something that uh, um shaped me quite early so um I, yeah touch would never had a thing of saying oh i, I think i need to get paid more uh, at the same time yeah i think um, during my uh, the current uh, this i i i'm not you know uh, uh, doing charity when i'm working for corporates i i you know obviously the the idea is that you know there is a there's a value being provided and you you charge what, what you feel uh, you you're delivering value for um but yeah so um th- th- this also you know training as that i do now is really a lifestyle business right so mm. there's so much time that i get so that uh, is really you 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 uh, uh, money is definitely not something that i i optimize for no yeah, lovely and and we'll touch up on some of these things right it's not just there are multiple and uh, that's like space time continuum there's something called money time continuum right i think uh, yeah. so it's worth uh, keeping keeping your eyes on both um so let's uh, go back to choices career choices ravi uh, you know uh, you were a all india 11th ranker in ca final that's like a stupendous achievement man i think and then you worked in lnt for a couple of years then you went to ima then you worked for feed, feedback infra for about 6 and a half 7 years i think till that time i would say uh while each journey is unique this felt like a relatable journey of an aspiring hard working middle class um you know indian who sort of uh, uh you know striving to work hard and do well from then on i guess in a way you've made a set of choices which i thought were interesting so can you just take us through maybe the key key choices that got you here and maybe a little bit of context on the why behind those choices yeah no ha- happy to deepak so um i think the initial few choices were not really mine it was really shaped by you know by parents and you know the the safe driven thinking right that right. Uh, let's let's take the safe call and let's do one of those you know reliable degrees and um i was actually a very ordinary ca professional in during my limited time that i worked as a finance professional in either in my article ship or even in lnt was i think not at all i think i was very good at giving exams so which is the reason why you see those uh, those performances so you you asked me to give an exam i think i'd do very well in that don't ask me to work in that career uh, so i think uh, the uh, choices started to happen post ima right so ca was driven by my dad's uh, push uh, lnt kind of you know that was a, one of the few opportunities that came and it was during lnt that i started feeling a little worried about my long term prospects for work because i was not mm. really engaged at work uh, it was an interesting role um, uh, the executive assistant to the cfo mr devasali and very he's a very sweet guy gentleman but at the end of the day he's a cfo of a you know huge conglomerate he's not going to have time to mentor me and guide me and so i was quite alone in that sense there weren't too many people i could actually get mentorship mm. from and grow and mm. uh, the role was kind of trying to um, read up 
stuff that might be interesting to him and summarize that uh, for him uh, mm -hmm. and essentially be his research eyes and ears you could say like a research assistant plus plus some other uh, works um mm. and um so uh because of a lack of i guess mentorship and guidance i was reasonably disengaged during those one and a half years that i was there and um then i may happened and i may can be a bit of a jolt right to to multiple things especially your ego and so i felt that jolt especially uh in uh, the quantitative subjects and uh, so it was somewhere like in the middle of i may where i was genuinely uncertain of a will i be able to even you know, prove myself in whatever work, the huge amount of imposter syndrome had come oh. in, right? You know, I think I was just good at giving these exams. I don't think I'm a, forget about, you know, uh, the, the mathematical subjects, but in finance, I don't think I'm as good as I thought I was. Uh, so a lot of those doubts started creeping in. And uh, I remember there was this Beatles song called Nowhere Man, which used to be kind of keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. keep it's playing a big favorite in, of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love playing that in my song. mind at that time. My daughter and I have recorded a version of that song. Oh, yeah, lovely. Yeah, I, I should listen to it. I should listen to it sometimes. Yes, so yes, I, I should yes. listen to that thing. That, that's me. So, um, and so uh, I, was, I was really unsure of what to take up. Uh, so before feedback happened, there was a talk by this guy called Aditya Nataraj. Uh, yes. At that time, he was with Pratham. Uh, I think yes. later he set up uh, Kaivalya uh, Fellows Foundation. Fellowship mm. Foundation. And so uh, he came and just talked about Pratham's work in Ahmedabad. And I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, this is so important. The kind of work that he's doing. And Aditya is, is a very inspiring uh, speaker. And uh, somehow that put in the seed of saying to work, to do some work for the social sector. I briefly considered actually leaving the placement system and, you know, <laughs> taking a Pratham, but I didn't have the guts at that time. So I kind of uh, came back. And at that time, this uh, relatively new company, new uh, unknown company called Feedback Ventures came to campus. And it had a small uh, consulting team led by uh, a person called Gopal Sarma and two others called Mukesh and Monica. And so they were all, uh, I am, in fact, Gopal and Monica were from IMA. And so the way they came and they spoke about the work that they did, it was an infrastructure consulting. It just seemed to tick a lot of boxes for me. First of all, the people, the incredibly sweet and, and charming people. Uh, to the the work seemed to be interesting because you're trying to, you know, in my mind, the story I told myself, I'm building India's infrastructure, right? Which wasn't really what I ended up doing, but uh, it was a useful story uh, to kind of take that up. And uh, consulting was unknown for me then, mm -hmm. uh, but I said, Let, let's take that punt. So I think that call I took uh, on, on, on the back of those people and, and the sector, but I actually ended up loving consulting as a, as a skill, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, people, of course, give a lot of... Um, negative uh, uh, impressions. Uh, people have a lot of negative impressions of consulting, but I think there's a lot of value to what uh, a good consultant can do in terms of really uh, demystifying very complex, um, you know, uh, data and, and uh, information that's out there and helping clients take uh, critical decisions. So, uh, so those years, seven years with feedback in Delhi were very, very formative. And I uh, built definitely the, the problem solving part, but I think more importantly, the bigger growth for me happened in the communication part. And mm. I was like a, most people guilty of, you know, just throwing information at that way. I got a request from a client. Okay. Let me just drown you Dump. in everything, oh. all the analysis that I've done and hopefully something will stick. And I still remember this uh, conversation with a person called Abhishek Sharman, who, who's right now with Carpe Diem, uh, partners. Mm. He was with a firm called India Equity Partners. Yes. And we used to do consulting for them. And um, I once asked him that, you know, Abhishek, do you have any feedback for me? How can we do better? And he just said one line, right? That, um, Ravi, I think um, you rely too much on just sharing a lot of data and information. I think you should just focus on telling the story of what, what you've found. It seems incredibly banal, right? You know, okay, so what? Yeah, of course, there's a story in there. But at that time, I think that's what I needed to hear. It was about 2009 mm -hmm. or so, nine or 10. And it almost like, clicked a switch in my mind uh, to say that um, when you have a lot of data, it's not about sharing everything, but it's about extracting a narrative or a story. And um, I think all my presentations since then have kind of led with a narrative or a story. Um, and so that, that moment for me is something that, that I'll never I'll always be thankful to Abhishek for, for giving the sparking that insight in me. And then a bunch of books also that I read around that pyramid principle, actually pyramid principle came later, but McKinsey way, uh, a brilliant book called made to stick by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, which is mm. probably my most influential storytelling book. All of those, I think played a huge role. So I think this, uh, consulting gave me the, 
the foundation material for what I'm doing now. Uh, so I'm hugely grateful for that time period. But bef- between that and between now, there were two transition points. Um, one was that, you know, Aditya's talk was always at the back of my head and I wanted to do something in the social space. I wasn't sure which area, health, uh, education mm. or whatever. And at that time, I happened to read an article uh, by this lady called, uh, I think, Shobha Mitra Kalita. I, I remember. Mm-hmm. So she used to write in Mint. And she wrote about this thing that India has this dual problem of huge unemployed youth and uh, companies or employers who are not getting skilled manpower. Mm. And so anybody who solves that problem will do a great service, right? And so it kind of seemed completely obvious to me. Of course, you know, there's a huge opportunity there. And I'm sure there is a, uh, you know, possibility to make this a financially sustainable model. You can charge Mm. some money from the youth and from the companies and, uh, you know, you're also helping uh, India's livelihood and employment problem. So with a lot of those stars in my eyes, I kind of started looking up companies in that sector. And 2011 was when I joined a company called Be Able. Uh, started again by two IMA alumni called Vijay Mahajan and Sushil Ramola. Sushil was the CEO. And again, it was uh, the, the final call happened because of a conversation with the uh, chief operating officer called Abhishek Gupta. So Abhishek uh, and I have been friends since then. And hugely inspiring person and I really enjoyed talking to him and I said okay this is the company that I'd like to join because there's a team that I'd like to be with so three years I spent there um, basically doing uh, a strategy planning uh, you know so I didn't change the entire work that I was doing Um, I was working more like a internal consultant but trying to help them take better decisions by looking at data by finding the right placement partners etc so that call happened in 2011 and for three years, uh, I, I worked there. It was broadly good in terms of, you know, the learning that I had, the people that I worked with. But uh, where it kind of started falling apart for me was the original hypothesis of saying, oh, uh, this can work because there is a, you know, demand supply mismatch is not really true in the market uh, place, right? So there is this is mm-hmm. a classic market failure sector, uh, as we see in economics, uh, because neither are companies willing to pay for training because they don't know that the employee will stick nor are students willing to pay for a short-term training. They'd, they'd be happy to pay if it's like an engineering degree, a computer, a long-term computer course, but not for a three-month hospitality training. Um, so typically what happens in the skill development sector is that the government end up ends up sponsoring most of the training. And then your customer is not the youth or the company. Uh, so you're not building or optimizing for quality of the training. Your customer is the government. And you're optimizing the saying, how can we make sure that we get the government contract? How can we make sure that we mm. are, you know, mm. keeping all their requirements intact and their documentation stuff and their collection issues and all of that. So um, that's a completely different skill set, right? And I realized I didn't really have that, uh, you know, in me. Um, so 2014 was when I decided to kind of, you know, I wanted to do something else. Mm. So now what, what else? And here is where life took a completely different turn and, I need to kind of maybe step back and uh, tell you that, you know, while I'm reading all through all these years, uh, especially nonfiction, history has always been an interest area for me. So I'm, I, I read up about Indian history, about global history. Uh, one book called Guns, Jumps and Steel is yes. something that I... I yeah, Jared Diamond. Hugely, yeah, Jared Diamond. Hugely influential. And so um, while I'm taking a break from Be Able, this is about early 2015 or late 2014, I'm in, um, uh, I, I'm going for a trip to the south with my family. And we are in this uh, town called Tirnal Valley, uh, which is yes. deep south, which is kind of my native district. And there, there's a, uh, the main temple in the town is called Nelayapur uh, Temple. And so I'm just roaming around there. So this typical South Indian temple, you know, this big gopuram and ornate pillared hallways. And it's beautiful. It's stunning inside, right? And And my mind is thinking, you know, who built this? You know, how did they have the finances to do this? Uh, what was the logic used in the architecture? You know, how would you explain this temple to an inter- intelligent lay person of 2015 at that time and not uh, dumb it down or make it about, you know, architectural details, which, you know, I'm not really honestly interested in an architectural understanding of that. I'm more interested in the economics of it, the politics of the place, the stories, the human stories, but nothing was really available. And so that's when this, you know, thought came that, you know, how about we uh, try and make historical monuments interesting by researching 
and then presenting uh, these stories in an interesting way through an app and this was when apps had become more and more uh, popular right so and this was so uh, you was... had somebody else to work with at this phase or it was just you thinking yeah, of this so as a i was just talking about this idea with a um, with a batchmate of mine called deepthi and deepthi was uh, at that time i think she had left she was in png but i think that time she had left and her husband siddharth who was one batch senior to me and uh, siddharth uh, also an engineer and he had a part time uh, you know uh, he was a co-founder in an app development company so then our uh, you know combination i thought was great on paper because deepthi comes from a marketing perspective from png siddharth comes from a technical he understands the app development part completely and i came from the world of the content piece right so we said okay how about the three of us get together and build this out and they also had traveled a lot and they had really uh, had had great experiences when the storytelling was good in in monuments like in in istanbul in in cambodia and so they also thought yeah this is a product that needs to be there for the for the tourist of today and so so that on paper it sounded great right whenever we tell it to our friend they'll be like oh my god that's a great idea and hmm. so so we started in 2014 and you know where the direction is going of the story and um, yeah, just to pause we, there just yeah, to pause sure. there ravi i would say back to your parents and uh, the the communities we come from and the emphasis on brands and you know uh, safety nets and reliable careers what was you know if you can sort of explain what was going through the minds of your parents and were you married at the time i'm curious about the family's response to some of these calls yeah that's that's a great question deepak right so it it wasn't um, as difficult as i thought it would be i think credit mm. to all of them so let me give you some context about uh, so i think for uh my dad and mom the basic thing was ki you know you have to come to the one level where that insurance safety net is there right and Achha. i think that was taken care of with uh, with feedback. the ima degree and 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 feedback also right seven years so i think by, by the time they knew okay now it's up to him like if he wants to take time crazy calls time pass nahi karega time pass nahi karega right and <laughs> there is a strong safety net that is there in fact i remember the convocation speech by raghunam rajan at ima he exactly used this word that now you have an insurance so feel right. free to take risks um and uh, so i think from my parents i think that was it i must tell you this right so my wife has been incredibly supportive um i i i spoken about during our just before or around the wedding time itself i told her that i am working right now with a for profit consulting firm and all but uh there is a skida in me that i want to work in the social sector and i might take that call sometime so i did end up taking that call 7 years after uh after the feedback and actually 5 years after marriage so uh so she was supportive for for that completely um the i the, okay so the, the i don't know whether i'd have been able to take this without a huge financial safety net that we had which is my father in law mm-hmm. so uh, my father in law uh, goes against the grain of typical tambram uh, you know south indians working with uh, you know uh, typical companies for the ent- entire no career risk. so he was incredibly entrepreneurial uh, he was with lnt um, uh, in his career but he wanted to do something on his own after the age of 40 i think 41 42 is when he uh, set up his own uh, company uh, along with another partner uh, initially to do designing of uh, industrial walls and then they set up manufacturing and uh, you know one thing led to another and they grew and grew and grew and so they uh, really did very very well for themselves and uh, he he uh, set up his business in pune and they, they did really well so so he was uh, very well off right and uh, somewhere that um, so his balance sheet was our kind of final safety net so we never had Fair to on. kind of you know draw on that uh but we didn't have to worry about saying that oh my god what will happen you know but it's half psychological right correct 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 it's just a what if kind of a thing right in case it's I a what if kind of a thing right and yep. i don't yep. know deepak would we have would i have taken this level of risk especially i think captivator was a bigger risk because be able i was still getting paid uh mm-hmm. and i was able to manage the the house finances captivator was the bigger and it was only a one and a half Is a, is a is a storytelling uh, thing huh? storytelling the, the history storytelling app understood historical okay. storytelling app and uh, about a one and a half year um uh, free fall where i was not earning anything mm. um i don't know or think i would have been able to take that call without that safety net i think so i like the term free yeah. fall i use that often as well because that weight the feeling of weightlessness is extremely uncomfortable for people especially when you're transitioning i use it in the context of uh, people taking a break i say i take a six month break one year break and then explore right and that one year is is a free fall like you don't have anything to latch on to and it can be extremely uh, anxiety inducing 
uh, for a lot of people. Um, so sorry, I think I interrupted you. No, no, no. I about... was completely on a wing and a prayer, Deepak. There was no... Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, this is how startup dreams are done, right? People just kind of, you know, jump and then they say we'll figure out something. Right. Um, and uh, to cut a long story short on Captivator, it didn't pick up, right? And I think we did our best in terms of uh, reaching out to the right audiences. We, mm -hmm. we did our uh, tours in Delhi, Agra and Jaipur, the, mm -hmm. the most, uh, you know, tourist-friendly places in India. And um, I think we did our... Uh, as as much as you could in terms of uh, reaching out to the right hotels, B&Bs and uh, mm. to, tourist agents. And uh, somehow people didn't bite. The foreign tourists were mm. coming, who were spending you know, thousands of dollars on tickets. All we mm. were telling them is, you know, going to a Red Fort or a Taj Mahal, um, spend a few dollars on, on this tour. It'll significantly increase. But I think people's willingness to pay for content um, is mm. always a challenge, right? Everybody wants everything free. And I didn't think we, we had it. had... <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so there was no monetization kind of a thing i don't think we had the uh the courage the mental financial bandwidth to say oh no we'll stick it out and you know we'll make it work right and maybe would have pivoted into something else by saying oh we'll offer other services and all but none of us were interested in that uh, yep. I didn't want to touch the government in any way. I didn't want mm. to get into saying, okay, let's make this a logistics company. Because that's all far removed from what I thought I'm going to be interested in, right? So so I think uh, we decided, to, and by the way, this was happening and the, the other career also kind of took off while this was there. So it also helped me to have that transition from captivator to training. So maybe mm. I can talk about that transition next. So but that maybe happened, just before you go there, yes. Yeah. I think I will, it's it's interesting that you framed what you will do and what you will not do based on what you would be interested in rather than where the market is, right? Again, I notice there are two different perspectives very often people take. Some people say, yeah, market hai, yahan ja ke hum ye company khada karenge. And there is a group of people that say, mujhe ye karna hai, ye karne mein maza hai, and I will stick to this. So it's, it's a, I'm just saying that it's an interesting way, not to say one is right, one is wrong, but I think we all need to stay true to who we are and what gives us energy. Right. Uh, I totally agree with you mm. on that, Deepak. And you know, I used to always feel if in my place there was a smart Madhu businessman kind of mm. a person, you would have said, forget content, Ravi, nahi chal rahe. Chalo, let's find out what the tourists need. Let's talk to Paisa them. Let's, rahe. you know, Haan. pivot. Paisa Paisa rahe. And that's how it should be, right? Which is why people like me should not be running businesses because we are not the right people to run businesses. So, and I hugely respect all of these because they find and they create great products for people who need yes. what they really want. So I was just trying to say, okay, I have this solution. Please will you take it from me? And people didn't want that solution. So, uh, so I, yeah, um, I completely agree with you. Right. So, and you should uh, figure out what do you want? I think that is a trickier one. Often we say, Oh, let the market wants it. Let me do it. Let me stretch myself and do it. And I knew maybe I was also at, a, at an earlier age, I might've still done it deeper, but I, at that age, I was like, oh, this is not me. So I could clearly... I mean, just, to give you a, just to give you a personal anecdote, this weekend I was in my community, I was talking to somebody who runs a investment advisory firm. He said, yeah, uh, coaching business seems to be booming. Uh, just uh, I'm just asking out of curiosity, can a private equity investor come and invest in a company? And let's say, Deepak, you sort of hire five, 10 people and you train <laughs> them. And then you run a coaching business and is there scale? And clearly there seems to be a need for coaching. And then I said, yeah, I want to be a surgeon. I don't want to build a hospital. So I think somewhere we all need to stay true to what gives us joy. But sorry, I think you were beginning to talk about the ramp up of your training journey. Yeah, no. So I, but hi, I, I completely, uh, like, I think that was also an interesting learning for me that, you know, um, when, when you try something, you realize how much you want it also, and that will drive how much will you go ahead for it. Hmm. Um, so at about mid uh, Late 2015 uh, or early 2016 was when um, we were trying to make Captivator work. And so we were, of course, you know, trying to add on more content. We were trying to do the work on the sales side and of course the funding side also. Till this time, it was all bootstrapped, right? The three of us had mm. put in our money. Uh, thankfully, we had not gotten any money from anybody else because we were mm. friends who were asking, hey, do you need some money? Um, and so I, I, thankfully, you know, there some conversations also happened, but thankfully no money came in. It would have been, um, yeah, it would be tough for me. So, uh, one person who was, uh, you know, uh, I was told to go and talk to was a guy called Sriram Subramanian, uh, who mm -hmm. lives in Pune and, uh, yes, Darth was my co-founder. He said, you know, go talk to him because he's also a history buff and he might be interested to, to give us some funding. 
so i remember meeting him in a barista uh, and because it was a important meeting i remember the place the time and all of that uh, somewhere in the afternoon in camp in pune mm -hmm. and uh, before you go to a meeting you look up the person right so i looked him up and then you know came across this firm called mind matters which is where which is what he had founded and i realized mind matters is basically doing training of stuff that i learned during consulting Uh, how mm -hmm. do you do better problem solving how do you do structured communication how do you manage clients said, that's interesting i didn't know that you could actually teach that and people would actually pay you for that but how much will they pay you know, i don't think it will be too much where all the kind of questions in my head right so i uh, i thought oh, that this could be i, I could you know if, if the captivator funding part doesn't come through maybe i could ask him that can i can i come in with you so i actually went in clearly with that double agenda and uh, in the very first 2 3 minutes he said i don't have any money to fund you guys but tell me more about your business of course i told him about the, the captivator part but I, my conversation then moved on to what he does in mind matters and uh, thankfully for me uh, you know sometimes you know life gives you uh, these you know lucky breaks right he had space to take on more people and you know i i've been doing this for 7 years and i mm. think at that time uh, sri ram mosha been doing it for around similar time i don't think i can take on more people and it's also mm. uh, a reflection of who i am i'm not True. comfortable giving over yeah. control uh, right. yeah I, i like to you know uh, be in full control of what, what i offer but uh, thankfully shriram was he already had like three four other people who were mm. uh, you know doing part time training for him and he had like a roster of three four big clients and then many 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 uh, you know uh, smaller smaller not in terms of the company but in terms of the work they did with did with him so he said oh yeah i i think i can take you on and i can you know we will start with something so um he kind of of course looked up my credentials and all but huge credit to to sri ram that it is not like he said okay give me a mock training this day and you know i want to see you in action he just mm. somewhere trusted and uh, incredible I, i i don't think i could do that with anybody but the way mm. he trusted me was uh, really heartwarming and uh, he said okay i'm going to do a session with uh, with this bank in bombay uh, 2nd march 2016 and you do a, a part of that so i i'll do the the you know 60% you do 30% or 40% whatever i said yeah sure happy to and so that's how i kind of ended up uh, driving with him from pune to bombay uh, with a bunch of you know about 35 to 40 year old uh, mid level uh, you know banking executives and i ran some part of a session on data analysis it was not even identified selling then and um, it wasn't great I, i think i was very stiff and i was not really myself I was trying to use somebody else's content but i think i tasted blood ki acha this is interesting and uh, then um, that was just what the first session and he it was broadly positive he gave me some feedback uh, the next big break that he gave me was in may itself of that year in 2016 saying that uh, this is a large client that i have uh, in bangalore they are a, a large investment firm huge back office doing a lot of work in analytics uh do a, a two day workshop on data analysis and he just left me to do it on my own and i you know scrambled put up the content put everything together um first workshop went off well and there one of the senior members said hey you know there's this new book come which is called storytelling with data i think you should look it up and i read it and it was actually more about visuals uh, not mm. not the entire thing but um i could see where i could use some part of it right but it called kind of gave me the name uh, so that's when i called the the core story effect effective storytelling with data and uh, from there it has been kind of you know one block after block after block after block where i have been you know building the courses and the workshops um uh, trying to figure out and reach out to more clients and you know adding on more clients um and also so one huge part of what i do is of course the training and the mentoring part but the other huge part is uh, writing about it researching reading mm. uh, the podcast happened later so currently now what i do is kind of two parts right one is the the r&d part which is the fun mm. part uh, and the second is the the monetization part which is the training part so but broadly that was kind of i would say the the last big transition and then Got after it. that it's been uh, me just exploring and finding uh, more big parts within this lovely lovely and uh, you know we we discussed this notion of flavors right when we when we spoke you know um and you've spoken about the family context a little bit and maybe also touched upon what really gives you joy uh i think what will be nice is if you can talk uh, you spoke a little bit about time and money right earlier in the conversation maybe cut to today what does your pie chart of time look like uh and what element of that is you know uh, the two things you mentioned the r and d and the training and what else goes into that pie chart 
yeah no ha happy to share that and you know when you ask that question uh, i was reflecting on you know how that pie chart has changed over mm. time i'd love I for you that's... to talk about that as well yeah yeah and because the current state i am in is possible because of the pie chart mm. that was when i was in my 20s right and mm. um so uh, obviously i would kind of divide this into three or four sections saying that you know there is a pre marriage mm. uh, uh you know context there is a post marriage pre kids yes. context and then there's a post kids uh, young kids especially and then hopefully um there'll be a different context when it'll be post kids who are older and you know once you are kind of ready to leave the nest so um the pre marriage part was where i'm glad that you know the ca days had given me a very strong work ethic deepak right mm. you know because during that time everybody is working like crazy you work uh, you go to college then from there you go to an article ship then you go for classes you come home by 9 in the night and rinse and repeat for monday to friday saturday uh, or sunday there will be like a uh, sometimes it used to be even saturdays and on sundays i'm there sometimes you have to go and give an exam right and you would not really bother about saying that you know i'm working too hard because everybody is doing it mm. so uh, i when i during my consulting days uh, there used to be a lot of stretch we used to work late and uh, night outs were reasonably common and uh, i know there's a huge debate now in terms of you know how much work should you give especially when you're young i tilt in the direction of saying if you're if you love the work that you're doing and which is an important one if the people are also you know invested in your growth and success and and you enjoy working with them then over index on learning and growth right and over, you know optimize for that um the the life part will come the True. hopefully the money part will also come so i think during those the amount of effort that i put in during my feedback days is something that i think has held me in good stead mm. for it was a great foundation on which then i could uh, uh do everything else that that came later even i think marriage did not change that it should have changed a little bit but did not change that much there, there was a fair bit of travel uh, i remember i was like out for months sometime because you know you know consulting sometimes you kind of you know go out for a long time um and uh, pravina was uh, super understanding and uh, slowly started things started becoming better towards the later part but i think only after i left consulting things became a little more mm. clear you know easier from a work life balance point of view and since then so since 2011 i've not um, had like a very very rough uh, working life but to be fair to be honest i was also getting jaded and tired of that mm. lifestyle uh, and mm. I, i yeah huge respect to people who can do that later but i think that beyond a point it becomes very difficult um so so i think that shift happened uh during uh my beable and uh, captivated days things were okay it was not really major stretch so coming to my current uh, uh this uh, from a work point of view it's this is what people call as a lifestyle business right because i'm completely in control of my time um i rarely have to work during uh, diwali and christmas holidays because no trainings are scheduled during that time and uh, even during summer vacation if i want to take a break during a for a month i can do that because i can always schedule trainings work around uh, post mm. or pre work around it so so i think that gives a lot of flexibility which is which is great and um, because actual training that happens would be like one day or two days intense and then after that there's not much um so i end up doing the actual training part maybe uh, it it really varies month to month but some days it could be maybe six days a month some days eight to 12 days a month so 8 to 10 would be like an average uh, i would say and so the rest of the time is uh, honestly available to me and if mm. if i uh, of course there's preparation that is needed but now because the content is broadly in place the only preparation is doing the customization for the industry and for the company mm. right so taking some mm. examples which are relevant but otherwise the ideas the concepts are still the same um so that that doesn't take too much time uh, so um, i could actually you know just sit back relax read do anything that i want but uh, there's so much that i want to do in uh, writing about the 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 ideas of storytelling uh, i want to do so much more on the podcast i'm struggling to find uh, time there um and uh, i want to do some community based stuff around storytelling in uh -huh. in and around pune so uh, I, i was telling you this right ki there is a song called hazaro khwaish hai si ki har khwaish mein dam nikle that there are so many desires that i want to kind of do multiple things so there is a lot of uh, um desire in me 
to explore this world of storytelling uh, in in multiple ways so to give you a couple of examples right so i've been working with non profits in how mm. can they use of storytelling course. to tell yeah. their to tell their we added a lot of better. value to uh, social venture partners uh, as part of the fast pitch so thank you yeah, for it's been great yeah working with yeah. Uh, you know committed partners like social venture partners with uh, ilss um, india leaders for social sector uh, yes. unlimited india so a lot of these beautiful platforms which give uh, non profits uh, a way to to grow and learn um then i i'd want to do something in storytelling for teachers how can teachers use techniques of storytelling to tell better uh, to explain concepts better in the classroom um oh, i want a life to skill that's s- applicable everywhere right i think everywhere, in any everywhere, profession everywhere. it's it's a, it's a life skill yeah. it's not a profession dependent skill right as a parent as a, as a spouse um you know as a as a teacher as a consultant as an investor you know i think the professor damodaran of new york university i think he says right valuation ashwatya ashwat damodaran right is as much about storytelling and the story as about numbers sort of, yeah as as it about numbers right so clearly you're onto something which is in a way uh it, it's a large market it's not a niche market right in terms of and so niche. again yeah as you we were talking earlier it's not i'm not looking at it from the market point of, of view i'm looking at you know what is my um interest and you know i really feel one lifetime is not enough to to uh, to explore all my interests but uh, uh so for example history i love to do history storytelling talks um and you know uh, organize it. yeah so i i can i can and maybe just a good this. time to good time to ask the question right ravi you know the other piece i'm curious about as we sort of go back to flavor right i think i'm curious about how the shape of aspiration shifts over time you know you know for me at some stage it was a je rank at some stage it was a certain job at a certain stage it was a being a partner in this organization whether it's mckinsey or egon zender and now i feel it's a little more multidimensional i'm curious about how how it's evolved for you and where it stands today yeah so um it i don't think i'd had like very very clear goals it was a lot of the uh time going with the flow like let's see mm. where this takes us types right so of course you know when you're giving the ca exam the first most important thing is please let me pass in the first attempt that's the most okay. most important aspiration that any ca uh student has and uh, then yeah so uh, i think as i mentioned the brand right so to work with a reputed brand was more important mm. and you know somehow grow there and figure out again no thing that i want to become this cxo what nothing like that was there um again let me get into ima and then then life will be fine so that it, it was there uh, i think after feedback uh, surprisingly i didn't really have a thing that i want to rise to this level within feedback so feedback i was part of a smaller group within the consulting group which is itself as a small group which was into healthcare consulting hospital we were working mm-hmm. for hospitals right so as a group we had an aspiration that we want to be the best in the country in this particular niche mm-hmm. it was a smaller mm-hmm. niche not a very large and uh, we were trying to work towards that i mean when, when i look back i can see that you know oh my god you didn't do anything on marketing there was no content development what were you thinking ravi karke mm. but yeah so i think that that aspiration was there um moving to be able i think the aspiration was to build a self sustaining model to you know without government dependence can you make skill development uh, you know work and uh, you know the, the uh the aspiration was not so much towards any any form of uh, financial um, hmm. you know rewards but for the amount of uh, uh, the, let's face it the social rewards that will come right in terms of the recognition in terms of you know wow this is great how did you guys crack this market hmm. so at that time uh, i think microfinance was already starting to feel some tensions but there was a part i think 2007 8 when when microfinance was really um uh celebrated as this brilliant new model where a you are working for uh, the underprivileged and it is a for profit mm. uh, you know model that works well and you know guys like vikram akulla were mm. um, regarded w- very very highly right so i think some of that rubbed off on me that i wanted to kind of maybe uh, be seen as a, a very uh, yeah well known social entrepreneur who's kind mm. of opened up something and um, looking back yeah the the sector itself i don't think had had the legs for it but i don't think i had the entrepreneurial skills mm. to make any of that work uh, i think that same aspiration was with captivator also right where mm. the idea was you know hey you know we can actually not have this entrepreneurial genes and yet make something work by just being focused on a good product 
and the customer experience uh, Ravi, but i think I may, if... so, sorry to interrupt ravi i think the only piece i might ask you to also weave in if you can is when i say aspiration instead of ambition i'm also looking for how people think about the various domains of life you know mm. as you get married you you also start thinking about yes i want to be a good spouse good father you know so i'm just sort of throwing it there at least uh, conceptually all of us have professional ambitions but i'm just trying to i'm i'm curious about how some of the other dimensions grow as well just in terms of the kind of person you want to be uh, i'd be curious about how if and when those kinds of things appeared in your if if uh, appeared in your aspiration set so i, I don't really have like a goal or hmm. aspiration it was more like be hmm. respectful be kind be um, hmm. empathetic to others mm. so it's more like you know the 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 way i behave i didn't really have an aspiration and i i tell this to my wife also right so for me work is my first child so even mm. now it's totally telling i i like love my children to bits but uh, um it's really if, if for pravina it is clearly number one is advait number two is swara or number one is advait and swara and mm. then it's her work which is amazing right so for me mm. i think it's um I, 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 it's it's good bad ugly no, i don't fair, know but uh, it's it, it is right so i obviously i because of the work that i do it gives me a lot of time so i really enjoy spending that time with uh, with the kids um and if i may come uh, in right i think uh, i love the words right you say i want to be you know in the in, the, in some of the coaching work very often we also talk about to do lists and to be lists right you know and instead of saying i want to do x y z etc etc if you focus on yeah i want to be empathetic i want to be available i want to be generous i want to be kind mm. that it's a mm. good that that's a good enough yeah. aspiration in a lot of ways right if you can stay true to it and if you can make it happen right so i i love the language so so completely understand so all of the limited point i'm making is while you might frame work as your first love yeah by sort of shining the light on who you want to be on some of the other elements as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. you you're taking care of some of the other domains automatically right so yeah and maybe to um to to double click on the the family part right i think uh, i'm i have a lot of child like uh, enthusiasm and love for not just storytelling but for mm. movies for sports i i follow sports a lot for some kind of music so i one of my uh, what uh, uh, let's get do, specific right what's what sports or music if i may ask so cricket um, i i i read cricket for pretty much everything if there's a india a uh, men's cricket team match or something going on i would have read all the analysis and you know looked at all the highlights and so especially what what happens on cricket for uh music uh, it's a mix so uh, old hindi is where i started then now i listen to a lot of hindustani classical uh some of the uh, you know hindi film music but that's rare rehman i'm a huge rehman fan uh, beatles uh, simon and garfunkel um Lovely. and movies would be like um, anything which has got a good uh, narrative good storyline or some of these you know unabashed uh, um, big picture uh, movies like jailer i'm a huge huge jailer fan so the idea is that you know what i love i am passing on that love and enthusiasm to my family so of course you know pravina and i share a lot of this but to my kids so now advait also hugely follows cricket and uh, loves similar kind of music and uh, is you know uh, so I, i'm infusing a lot of my love and so it, it's for me that is where i think uh, of course uh, i'm finding ways to bond with, with them right and uh, uh, so my my devious plan is that you know so pravina doesn't like old hindi music too much because uh, maybe she didn't hear too much of that when she was growing up so i've kind of given up on her i don't think i can transform her but for the kids right so they obviously don't like if i play it but often they are not even like in control of what's being playing so if you're Correct. going driving somewhere they're just having a chat in the background i'll surreptitiously put some of those songs and so i think i'm making them listen to that so that when they are older uh hopefully they'll say hey dad let's play those kishor kumar songs <laughs> so uh, and so yeah, i think that that's i relate uh, that i my son and i go and learn the guitar on sundays huh. that's my time to choose the playlist and play the playlist uh, rd burman <laughs> and you know nice nice sort nice. of see yeah. those thoughts so uh anyway um well lovely lovely um i think moving moving forward uh, you know one of the other pieces i'm curious about also is this if i may use the word talent market fit right all of mm-hmm. us need to find that as we as we go through our journey at various points in time 
Uh, I also in our, uh, as we were sort of preparing for this conversation, you use the word skill stack, uh, yeah. which I loved as well. So I'd love for you to talk about how you've discovered uh, your talent market fit and you know what's been that journey like discovery process at various points in time. And, and maybe yeah, so I add to that, just the last point is, I think what we consider talent also that language evolves over time, right? I think we see ourselves with a certain lens and that lens evolves over time. So yeah, I'd love for you to reflect on that. Yeah, so this is also uh, something that um, I, I think I've read about in multiple places, but I think first time in Scott Adams' book, right? Uh, where, where, how to win, uh, how to fail at everything and still win big. Um, mm. Where uh, the the uh, you know he uses his own example, which has always struck with me, right? Where he says that uh, he's he's a I mean huge problems as a personality, but let's keep that aside. But he was a significantly successful creator of this comic strip called Dilbert, and Dilbert was funny. So um, what was surprising was that when he said that you know to be a successful cartoonist like me, you don't need to uh, have the best skills at any of the individual skills of cartooning. So you're saying I was not the best illustrator among people who illustrate. I was not the funniest person. And clearly I was not the best corporate employee. But I had this interesting, unique combination of being a corporate employee who was reasonably funny, who could draw reasonably okay. And mm -hmm. that combination is what made it unique, right? So so I'm also, I think that that kind of left an impression in terms of, you know, how what is it that I can also build something which is uh, different and unique. Uh, um, so if I kind of go back, I think consulting skills was something that definitely was a was a useful uh, building block in in my uh, talent stack. And within that also, right, if I dig deeper uh, within the communication or the storytelling mm. part also, one skill that I would say that helps me is the ability to uh, to make sense of new information, to make sense mm. of data, uh, to to find patterns in information, right? Um, so I, I remember in, in, in CAT, there are three papers, right? Math, English, and uh, data interpretation. So math was always a weak part. I just scraped through. English was good, uh, but surprisingly, I did really well in the third one, which is uh, data interpretation. So I, I'm able to kind of look at new data and find, and this is also me looking back in hindsight and saying, oh yeah, that, that also ties up. Uh, th there's this nice line uh, where I think, um, I forget who said it, where it says, say that, uh, um, I don't care about the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I do care about the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So where you are able to take in a lot of information mm. and present it in a way that makes it simple, right? So mm. to see that simple pattern in a huge complex mess of data. So, so that has been something that I've uh, realized uh, that I've been able to do that. Uh, a few examples that stand out are, uh, I think one, um, way back in LNT, so uh, my my boss, the CFO, wanted a paper, uh, like a white paper kind of a thing. On uh, there was a telecom crisis happening around then. This must have been early two thousands, and um, I started reading and reading and reading. And you know, typically what happens when you read, read a lot is you are like completely lost. Like mm -hmm. where is this going? What is what is what is happening here? And um, eventually, I could see broadly some patterns that were happening. And I wrote the note to him, and he actually came and said, "Oh, that was that was useful, right? Mm. So that was interesting. That was helpful." Um, and I enjoyed that process, even though there were parts where I felt, "Oh, this is completely going nowhere," right? So, in fact, when I during a you know creating a story, when I feel that, "Oh, this is I, this way above my head, it's going nowhere," I think it's a good sign. There mm. means there is the, the light, there's a light at the end of the tunnel that's going to come. Uh, similarly, I think in feedback also, there were parts where uh, I would be working with somebody else and they would have found all this information and we'd be kind of scratching our head saying, you know, what is the point here? What is going on here? And I would kind of maybe sleep over it or, or something. And eventually that story will emerge, which will simplify, tie up all the threads together. So I think that that is a useful skill. So even today when I teach, of course, I teach the concepts, but often people will then share their information with me. So I'm now looking at the slide of a a receivables manager or an HR leader or a technology guy, right? And mm. I don't know anything about their industry. I don't know anything about their work. And I'm reading all of this and trying to find patterns. Then uh, often, you know, you, you some of things will be very obvious that, you know, hey, maybe you can combine these two together. They're talking about the same advantage, you know, why you're having these separate points. But some require a little more nuance. And uh, that's fun for me to, in the moment, quickly find those patterns uh, mm. with completely strange uh, information. So I think that that's a... Uh, useful skill. 
Um, then I think writing has helped, right? So I, I used to write uh, um, for uh, reading, of course, was there since I was a kid, but I started writing somewhere in not uh, maybe 10th grade, 11th and 12th and so on, right? So for example, when we used to go with friends for trips, uh, mm -hmm. college friends, right? We'd go for a trip to Mathiran or, or a Murud uh, in, in Maharashtra and we'd come back and I would feel the urge to write about that experience. So just write like a three, four pager and share it just with friends, right? And, and I love um, what you said, if I may pause, it's not about writing, but it's the feeling, the urge to write. Yeah, that, uh, slightly different things. I know there are several writers, but to feel the need, you know, if I may, if I may come in, right? Uh, when I used to read books, I used to prepare these three, four uh, condensed PPTs yeah. to say, yeah, this is the net net of the book. And somewhere, I think that's where the seeds of the podcast were sown, where you say, yeah, I want to learn and share the learning in a certain yeah. curated way. So I love the word, uh, feel the urge, because that sort of, that's a very different uh, uh, thing. Uh, writing skill, many people will have, but not many might have the urge to, to sort of take a trick and put it in a, put it in writing. And I'm sure for you also, Deepak, it was not that you were thinking, oh, how many people will read this? Will they read it? Or you just wanted to get it out, right? And if people read it, it's fine. So, yeah. Right. And right. I, I almost have this feeling of, you know, just like, you know, it's almost like a pregnant with that idea mm. and it has to be delivered. Mm. And so there will be labor pains, but uh, it's it, you'll at the end of the day, uh, love the result. So, so I think, yeah, so I think, uh, and my mom's DNA and everything, I think coming through. So uh, somewhere writing uh, was always there. So that helps me today in you know writing uh, when i see something you know how to express that in a short way of course mm. on linkedin i write on my blog um mm. so i think that's a crucial part of the skill stack right so i can't mm. it's i think tough to be a storytelling teacher or a coach without having strong mm. writing ability um, mm. you know so i think that's that's a crucial mm. part of it i think teaching is another interesting part right so you could be mm. very good at um, <clears throat> figuring out patterns at writing but uh, there are people who are really, really good at what they do, but they struggle to teach that mm. to others, right? So there are so many stories of brilliant players, brilliant cricketers who are not necessarily the, the best coaches and people who are not necessarily great in the the actual sport, but brilliant as coaches, right? And we, we have got so many examples around that. So, uh, so for me, I think that uh, teaching part uh, is something that appealed to me from a fairly early space. So I am a... Uh, um, I used to be attending, uh, we, call, we used to call them REM sessions, remedial yes, sessions. Yes, yes, so yes. I would attend these REM sessions, anything that happens in math and yeah. But I used to be giving REM sessions in a few subjects. So one I especially remember, uh, it was called economic uh, EAP. Uh, not, environment and a, policy. Environment and policy. Oops. Yeah. Right. Uh, so EAP 2 was one subject that I really enjoyed. It was more about economic history. Uh, right. Thankfully, no no theorems and formulae were there. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that, right? Because it was history and, you know, how India's independence, how the economic uh, uh, policies were taken, etc. And so I used to be the one of the That's few Professor people paying Rakesh attention. Basant, in, was it? Rakesh, was it? Oh, I, I love, love Professor Basant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so yes, yes. so um, I used to pay attention in his class, used to take copious notes. And I used to love that feeling of, you know, others kind of leaning in and listening to your word. And you mm. being able to kind of, you know, share uh, information with them. Uh, so that w was a, you know, f fun part. I used to do a little bit of these, you know, uh, remedial sessions at uh, at IMA. And even at feedback, um, apart from, you know, presenting to clients and going yes. and getting clients, etc. There used to be parts where we used to run workshops for new joinees, right? Or mm. people moving in from one level to the other. And we were not big enough to say, okay, let's get people from out there. We would like, let's do it ourselves. So it was not easy because we didn't really have time as, you know, you're already running behind client deadlines and stuff. Uh, but I enjoyed that process also of, you know, converting what you know into teaching material. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, within the a teacher itself, there are multiple skills that come into play. Mm -hmm. You know, how mm -hmm. can you break things down to make it easy? How can you avoid the curse of knowledge? Uh, how can you engage the class's attention? You have to be a bit of an entertainer also in doing that. Um, so I think those, uh, that's also something that, you know, I enjoy uh, that part mm. of it. So I, I, I'd love to, you know, spend time with teachers to say, forget about the topic, whatever topic you're teaching, how can you teach that better? How can mm. you teach math better? How can you teach biology better? How can you teach mm. anything better? Right. And there are, I think, repeatable, I have in mind a, a course that I want to do only on better facilitation skills. So anyways, that's, that's a, 
Uh, and I think so. Yeah, th these are I think three core parts of the stack. Maybe a fourth mm. I would add is uh, um, relationship management and managing people. Right. So I, uh, I tend, I, I, I yeah, I, I like able to manage relationships in terms of you know not over promising, um, mm. delivering what what you're kind of giving, generally being you know respectful and nice. I, I, I know of others who can tend to be like you know this is my product and take it or leave it. But I'm able to do a bunch of that also. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, um, I'm grateful for, for all the growing up experiences that have given me a bunch of all of this to kind of, you know, mm, make me, mm. uh, enjoy this in a way that, that allows me to. Mm. So. I think if I may ask you to maybe explore one of the elements, right? I think I truly believe follow your passion is good advice, but it's incomplete advice, right? Clearly you've had a set of passions. I'm curious about you know, what are the mistakes you see people making? If I go back to this point of talent market fit, you know, what are the kinds of places where things go wrong? So what's been your experience in just sort of ensuring that what you enjoy, what you're skilled at also has some sort of a commercial, uh, you know, leg to it. How have you sort of uh, locked that? No, hundred percent. Yeah. So mistakes do happen. I've also made those mistakes in following my passion. Right. So, so I think I, I, the, the framework that, we typically go to to explain this is the ikigai framework which yes. i'm really looking forward to to flavor because it'll i think expand on that and make it more nuanced but if you kind of stick to uh, ikigai the, the, we all know about the four parts the ability uh, passion the economics and the social impact and typically we think that um, we are essentially we know our passion and we know our ability right mm. all we are trying to solve for is the market um, we want to make sure that is there a market for this? And I would say in a captivator or whatever, that was essentially what we thought we were trying to solve Correct. for, right? And that is a great unknown. But the uh, I think the lesson for me has been that all of these are unknowns. You actually don't even know, is it your, uh, even your ability is something that you're actually testing out. So okay. I would kind of say everything is a, is a hypothesis. Treat everything as a hypothesis, right? I think I've got a edge in this ability. I think this is what my uh, interest or desire or passion is. I think this is what the market needs. And I think here's where the impact will be there. So I love it. Uh, I love it. Hmm. It's much less deterministic and much, much more uncertain and much more evolving, right? Much more uh, emergent, as they say, right? In terms of how things play up. I, I you know, for, for me, Deepak, to, to take an example, right? I thought my passion was history. I thought, you know, hmm. I've been reading history books all my life and, you know, this is it. And when you, when you do that, um, forget about the fact that it, it may not work and others are disappointed, but you are disappointed that, you know, oh, am I, I'm not really enjoying this as much as I thought I should. Why am I not enjoying this? Do I not know myself? Right. Mm -hmm. And so you, uh, a lot of those negative uh, sentiments come into play and I actually realize history was not my passion. It was storytelling. I love the way stories were told in history, but I'll also mm -hmm. love the way Bill Bryson tells stories in science. I also love the way Shekhar Gupta tells stories in politics. I love the way Harsha Bokhle tells stories in sports. So that realization happened later. Uh, but earlier when I was going through that, uh, you know, thing, I was thinking, oh, you know, I don't know myself, right? So, so uh, I think, yeah, the treating every element as a hypothesis is useful. And then you trust, you really stress test it, right? You know, you can't expect that uh, what you believe will, will come, right? And uh, uh, the, that's where the balance comes. Sometimes you have to ride the the waves and, you know, maybe oh. it will, the interest will develop. But uh, sometimes you have to recognize, you know, actually this is not, uh, because I know people, by the way, who have, left management and gone into history full time mm. and i didn't have the guts to do that right and because mm. it is not really a, a strong passion of mine so so mm. i think yeah stress test everything including your ability and passion and yeah that will hopefully lead you to to the the true uh, goal no that's a that's a lovely point here i mean one of my podcast guests uh, was a lady called herminia ibara of the london mm. school and she used the phrase which i really love she says you can act your way into a new way of thinking. I love but that. You can't, you can't think your way into a new way of acting. So I think uh, that captures the essence of these transitions, right? You need to have certain humility with which you frame these hypotheses and test them. And, uh, you know, if there's resonance, then you start drilling for oil. Otherwise, you go somewhere else and start drilling for oil, right? Uh, uh, lovely. A couple of uh, things before we close this conversation, Ravi. Uh, I'm curious about how people build their uh, balance sheet over time, intangible balance sheet. One is sort of self, investing in yourself. Uh, and, and I'm asking it in an open way, right? Sort of it could be health, physical health, mental health. 
It could be capabilities. It could be something else. And the last is relationships. And clearly, family we've spoken about. But I'm curious about what's been your approach to relationships in the context of work, in the context of friends. Uh, because I do think these two elements are uh, particularly relevant, given that we all are likely to live longer. So I'm curious about your experiences with these two dimensions, what you do. Yeah, so I think um, given the nature of work I mean and we, we are in, right? So for, for us um, on the on the intellectual side, this happens even without any prodding, right? So we're constantly absorbing and learning. So for me, um, really that's the fun part. Um, mm. So if you kind of tell me, of course, un unless I have to plod through a textbookish kind of a mm. thing, which I struggle with, but most of the stuff that I pick up, like Adam Grant, I just read Hidden Potential, right? It was so interesting, engaging. filled mm. with so engaging. And uh, I could easily read that in a vacation. Um, hmm. uh, I, I'm just rereading this book called The Elements of Eloquence. Hmm. And it is one of the, the the most entertaining books that you'd ever read. And it is a book on storytelling techniques, right? On, on figures of rhetoric. Um, so for me, yeah, I think that... that a book. It's, it's, a book on it's eloquence book. It's better a, be eloquent, right? Yeah, yeah. So, no, but yeah, but I have read books on storytelling which are not interesting. So, <laughs> uh, so this is great. Uh, Mark Fawcett is is brilliant. So, so yeah, I think that that is the biggest part in which you know investing in myself through through reading through podcasts. Uh, you know, Creative mm. Potential is is doing such a big service, right? I Thank Sajit you. Pai keeps saying this that uh, uh, often if you want to pick the brains of top leaders you will not be able to wait till they write a book because who has the time to write a book? Hmm. So the best way to actually know what they think and what they, you know, um, uh, feel is to listen to them on a podcast, right? So uh, it's a great uh, hack that, you know, he's, he, he talks Correct. about that if you want he to actually, really learn he, more. He goes further to say, if you want ROI on time, read the transcripts. Right, uh, twenty minutes you're done. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah. ten you're minutes done. you're yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he calls himself a visile for that. Right, so yeah, yeah. I think right. uh, so. Podcasts have been also a great way, and uh, hmm. um, the the only thing that you know, um, uh, readers and listeners uh, of podcasts and books would always worry about it. And I I don't have enough time. There hmm. are so many more podcasts to listen to, so many more books. So, but that's that's I think that that keeps happening. Uh, out of curiosity. The other, yeah. You did. I mean, we've spoken on thanks for your attention on the podcast and the kind words on the Play to Potential podcast. But are there any other uh, any others that you would mention? Oh, there are many that have helped me. Now, recently, I am listening to uh, uh, David Perel, and he he has some good interviews with people on the art of writing. Mm. I, I forget the the name of it. Wait, it'll come. It'll be there on my on my phone. So. Uh, we how, I write. It out. Okay. how I Write, how I write. Uh, by David hmm. Perel. Uh, I love the the podcast uh, by Pushkin, right? So Malcolm Gladwell, hmm. Revisionist History, hmm. Hmm. Against the Rules, uh, Michael Lewis, Michael Cautionary Lewis. Tales, Tim Hufford. Uh, these are beautiful narrative, uh, you know, storytelling podcasts just for observing the skill of how do you build a narrative. Um, these are, I think, I think fabulous. Um, Amit Verma, doing incredible work in terms of, you know, if you want to know about India, uh, in terms of economics, in terms of history, in terms of uh, current affairs, yeah. politics, uh, very few resources that can that can be as good as that. Um, Tim Ferriss, some of his yeah. uh, interviews are, are, are very, very good. And uh, yeah, so these have been some of, I think, the, wow. the ones that have kind of uh, influenced me the most. In, in terms of books, I had mentioned Made to Stick, I think, as a, mm. as a big one. Um, uh, the Pyramid Principle is also something that has really uh, been very useful. Um, Matthew Dix uh, mm -hmm. has a book on storytelling. I'm forgetting the story worthy. Story worthy is also really good in terms of telling mm -hmm. personal anecdotes. I think there's no book which is kind of you know as as good as that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a bunch of others. I can share a link of with course. you that I've kind of, of you know, uh, that I've made. And I can add that so, to the notes. Yeah, yeah. The one interesting thing that has helped me recently, Deepak, and I need to do more of that, uh, is to attend workshops or courses by others. Hmm. And uh, there is this feeling that sometimes I have, you know, I, I'm good. I, I know broadly stuff in the storytelling space and I'm reading, right? What else do I need? But um, I realized that when I go to some of these courses, uh, not all of them work out, but in some of them, I'll get an epiphany that uh, changes the entire way I work, right? So, for example, there is a course that I did called Breakthrough Facilitation. And it was about the art and skill of facilitation uh, run by uh, a Canadian lady who's living in mm. Spain. 
and global audiences. Typically, these these are called cohort based courses, right? CBCs. So I done that last to last year, I think. And uh, uh, it wasn't in the course material. It wasn't what she told me. All of that was kind of quite logical. It was when I was in one of the breakout rooms grappling mm. with a problem. Then I realized, oh, you know, the real learning actually happens. What I'm realizing happens in a breakout room. And I'm not giving my students at that time enough opportunity to tinker and play and, you know, uh, discuss with other people. I'm, you know, spending too much time sharing supposedly mm. great content, disseminating that I have. Mm. Um, and I knew that in theory that I'm spending too much time talking. But for me to, you know, really realize that, uh, oh, I, I need to change. I had to go through that experience. So I had to get that breakthrough through that experience, right? So I also, you know, that, that shifted me in a, in a big way. And I sometimes worry Deepak, that I don't, you know, do more of that. It's just... a great point you make, Ravi, if I may share. I think in the choices we've made, especially in this whole passion economy, if I may, if you belong to a firm like Feedback or a McKinsey or wherever, there is apprenticeship and there's an opportunity to observe your colleagues at work and learn just by being a fly on the wall. You see a colleague run a meeting, then, you know, you just learn from just being a part of that room. But when you're on your own, there's nobody, it's basically you're operating alone in a, maybe you're operating with a few nurses in the in the theater, operation theater. There's no second surgeon to tell you, you know, what's working, what's not. So you're right. I think uh, when you, personally also for me, when I listen to, when I, you know, sometimes when I'm working with clients, there's another group facilitator or, a, you know, somebody else who's playing the role of a coach slash sounding board in a different capacity. And just uh, being a fly on the wall in that conversation uh, uh, just sort of triggers these kinds of things saying, oh, maybe I can facilitate this way. Maybe I can frame the questions this way, etc." So completely agree. All the more in the, if I may say, passion-driven, solopreneur kind of economy, I think this becomes that much more important, I would reckon. Yeah, um, so I think figuring out ways to go out of my comfort zone is has been hmm. um, something that I need to do more of. Um, any, uh, maybe just uh, the last piece on the relationships part, any, how have you thought about, you know, is there a, is there a certain uh, method to the way you've cultivated the relationship? I'm not... Again, uh, once again, using this in a sort of the uh, transactional networking kind of session sense, right? Genuinely, uh, how have you gone about what's what's been your approach to relationships, if I may, outside of family and close friends? So it's not been something that has been very easy for me, Deepak. I'm by nature a bit of a loner, right? So for example, if I go um, to a Bangalore or to a Delhi and I've done a full day session, I am a little mm. mentally tired. A lot of my batchmates would be saying, oh, you know, who else is there? I'm in Bangalore. Let's catch up or whatever, mm. right? Mm. I'm happy going to a restaurant, you know, nursing a cold beer and, you know, <laughs> watching something on my phone. Um, I so I think one part of it is I need to kind of go get away from that uh, a little bit. So, but I do crave community. I struggle mm. with a little bit of, um, so there's of course family and close friends, as you rightly said, right? But I love to be part of communities where people are coming together with some common interest, purpose, uh, mm -hmm. goal, or or just enjoyment of something together, right? And uh, mm. for example, for me, it could be storytelling in history or science. Mm. Um, it could be, you know, some form of physical activity that I like. Um, it, it could be just appreciation for craft beer, which I'm a big fan of, mm. or, or is something which combines some of these elements, right? And it's, I realize it's not easy um, mm. to find the right people or, uh, so I, I try and, you know, of course do it with, with the friends and family that I have to, to, to the extent possible. And so, so one, one of my favorite pastimes is having nice, deep, long conversations with, mm. with people, right. Especially over dinner and, and drinks. So um, I, of course, you know, do that on, on at every opportunity that I get with my friends and family. Um, but there are only so many that you get with, with them, right? So I, I'd love to kind of form communities around that. Um, not easy. Got it. So Got it. it's it's not it's no, something it's, that I'm still struggling with. It's an interesting point you make. For me, in a way, since you know the organization, social venture partners plays that role a little bit. You know, it gave me it gives me a community to belong to, where there's a certain shared uh, desire to contribute meaningfully to society. So when I left uh, sort of in a way Egon Zender to be on my own, 
uh, this in a way sort of gave me a bunch of people to hang out with meaningfully. Otherwise, I can imagine it would have gotten quite lonely. And you're right. I think if we don't have the community, we all have the opportunity to create that community around us. It just requires a little bit of work and maybe a little bit of research and uh, planning and discipline. So, Ravi, I, it's been a wonderful conversation here. I think maybe just as we wrap up, uh, uh, I'd love for you to maybe say net net. I think this the theme of this series is actually about living a flavorful life, right? Uh, and each one of us trying to find the flavor that works for us as as life unfolds and find multiple flavors that stay that's sort of fit for purpose as life context evolves. Any any headline thoughts just based on your lived experience and and uh, uh, your approach to life? I think I'd go back to the point that we had uh, spoken about, Adipak, about, uh, you know, having hypotheses, right? And for me also, that's been the journey that initially mm. the hypotheses that I had were not even mine mm. to become a CA uh, or to join LNT. But from my IMA days, I started having some of these hypotheses. In fact, if I kind of look back in many of the earlier transitions, many of them were um, more outside driven than internally driven so mm. um uh, uh, joining ima was completely a friend who said hey uh, i'm giving cat you should also give okay i'll also give it right and uh, feedback i was blown away by uh, the speech made by uh, gopal and, and mukesh and monica uh, aditya natraj's speech influenced me to get it so it has been external influences which have played a role and mm. they have helped me form my hypothesis and over a period of time now i am um forming these hypotheses myself, uh, of course, taking in a lot of external of uh, ideas, but it's not like I'm just copying and pasting somebody's idea on what, what I should do. But I think that broader point remains uh, for me that uh, even now I'm constantly thinking, you know, am I uh, completely happy in doing this? Uh, mm. Which part is it that is not, uh, uh, that I'm not fully engaged in, uh, which is a part where I feel that uh, my client may not be getting the most value so there is a bit of paranoia that's always there in my mind. Uh, there's a bit of that worry. And um, so I keep, you know, making small tweaks, making experiments. So the experimentation and hypothesis is always there. Um, the the uh, If I kind of look back at my journey, there were parts in my journey where I would fret. I would worry mm. that, oh my God, this is not working out at all. Even during the, the, the training part, right? And uh, in fact, in my 2017 was when I had reached out to a lot of potential clients and you know uh, we'd had a good run in early late 2016 uh, mm. but early 2017 there was no clients coming uh, even for Sriram and even the, the work that I was doing and there was a period when I was like you know maybe this is not for me maybe this is not the right thing so although you know I had found my calling by then but mm. even after you have to quote unquote found your calling uh, it will maybe take some time to accept you you also to, uh, need to find the market <laughs> To market, yeah. And <laughs> finding um, the calling also requires finding the market at some point, right? And, so for it to and be and the market is there, it may take mm. some more time to to recognize you, right? So of course. um I, I in fact at that time I remember a book that really helped me, uh, Daniel Pink to sell his human, where mm. he says that we are all in sales, mm. and um, a crucial part of being a salesman is you will be faced with an ocean of rejection mm. and you have to be buoyant in that ocean, right? So so that helped me at that time, you know, it, it made me feel that, you know, it, it's okay. It may not happen now, but it will, it will come. So even mm -hmm. if you get your hypothesis, right, uh, the, the market part will take some time. So yeah, I think, I think that, uh, uh, to, to, to stay the course, but to keep listening to your heart, uh, that, that balance is what, uh, you have to try and, you know, to, to balance and, and, and keep, uh, trying to look for the right flavor, not Ikigai. That that'll help you uh, no, find, think, find uh, your uh, joy in life. <laughs> and once again, right? I think Ikigai. I, I genuinely feel has a role. But I feel. I mean, uh, it goes back. I don't know if I shared it with you. It goes back to a quote by Lincoln that one of my friends mm. shared with me. And he says he's talking to somebody, and that guy says, uh, "You know, what about your principles? What about your mm. true north?" Mm. He says a compass would point you towards the true north. But the compass often has no guidance for the swamps or the ravines or the mountains or the ditches or the wells that you will encounter. So I think there is there is a place for true north, I feel. Uh, but I think uh, hopefully this gives people a little bit of language around navigating the swamps and the mountains and the valleys. It's a beautiful analogy. Uh, as, as, as they go through their journey. Hopefully it's a little more granular. It's a little more context specific. And the fact that there's no right answer. And as you write, I love the phrase you had uh, around almost taking a scientist's approach, right? Have hypotheses, keep testing them, 
I mean, one some somebody when I spoke to Dr. Ramachandra Guha, who had written the book about Gandhi, many books about Gandhi, I think he said there's a reason he titled the book "My Experiments with Truth." He didn't say my views on truth because it's exp finally we're all experimenting our way through these things and having hypotheses and testing them. So. Uh, Lovely, Ravi. Very, very energizing and uh, inspiring. Thank you so much for uh, making the time for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Deepak. I look forward uh, to to the book. Thank you. A couple of things struck me about Ravi. One is just the clear distinction between wants and needs. You know, it's fascinating for him to articulate very clearly what gives him joy and what's the line above which he doesn't get more happiness from more money. So I think sometimes just having a clear distinction between wants and needs can lead to a lot of contentment and joy. The second thing I found fascinating was the what he said about how we describe ourselves. He said that initially he thought he was interested in mythology, but over time he realized that what he was passionate about was actually storytelling, not mythology. Even in my case, initially I thought I was passionate about people. That's what took me from McKinsey to join Egon Zender. But over time, I realized that actually I enjoyed helping people, and in search, I was spending a lot of time evaluating people, and just tuning into that distinction has made all the difference. If you like this conversation, I hope you will find some of the other five that we have as part of this flavorful life series valuable. And if you want to go deeper into some of the insights around how to do inner work, how to lead a full multi-dimensional life, and play to your potential, do consider picking up the book. The link to where you can buy the book is available in the description section of the video. Thank you for listening.